All right, so hello everyone in the room and uh, remote. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ruihan Yang today, uh, who is giving his final intern uh, research internship presentation. Uh, Ruihan is a PhD student at the uh, University of Irvine in California. Um, he's working um, on uh, neural video and image compression models and also has also done some work on uh, music representation learning. And um, yeah, with that, uh, I the stage is yours, Ryan. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, presentation. So today I'm going to present my project, Synchronize uh, Audio-Visual Generation with a Joint Generative Diffusion Model and Contrast Loss. So basically, this is a very long title. And first, uh, thanks my mentor, Sebastian, for his help during my internship, and uh, Hannes for his feedback, and the, our some experiment plot, and other group members for the discussions about the research. So in this project, uh, we basically focus on a multimodal generative modeling regarding both video and audio. So the, for the primary uh, motivation of our models, uh, we think our model can be categorized into the following points. The first, the cross-modal understanding to help us to understand the, some um, implicit connection between the video and audio. And also, of course, the most uh, popular one is the content creation. And then maybe in the future, uh, it can also help us to improve the accessibility for some future product, products, like for the disabled people. And uh, in recent years, uh, diffusion models have demonstrated some remarkable potential and versatility in content generation. So yeah, this is a very promising result. So of course, we need to do more work on that to, ex to exploit more about the diffusion models. So this is the outline of my presentation. So first I will um, give a brief um, background introduction about the diffusion model and some existing works. Then I will explain the methods uh, step by step. Uh, and finally we will present some um, both uh, an objective and subjective evaluation of the, our model and also show some qualitative examples. So first, uh, begin with some diffusion model background. So basically, uh, intuitively, diffusion model is about just solving a reverse and diffusion equation. Uh, for here, basically, uh, we have a, usually to formalize a forward SDE, what our goal is to uh, the formalize uh, the forward SDE, we'll try to destroy the signal from the data distribution to a pure noise priors. So we are seek to solve this uh, reverse SDE to reconstruct the signal or create signal from this uh, noisy distribution. So uh, so the core part is this uh, score function, which is a great gradient of the data di distribution respect to data itself. So so our neural network will aim to, so, to learn this result. So in, in, from a different perspective, uh, diffusion model is also, is also about a latent variable model. So just uh, we just treated this different this one model in from two different perspectives, so so that we can solve this uh, diffusion model with the uh, with a training of the variational lower bound. So here I show some example about how diffusion model works generally. First, basically, what we do is that. For example, this is what we call the diffusion process, which is a stochastic process of the destroying the signal from the data and to the pure noise. However, then we would like to reverse this process by, um, by with the, our learned diffusion model to create the data. So basically, this is our loss function where we wanted to um, intuitively want to, to estimate this score function. And uh, actually, this score function can be um, uh, Reparameterize as an X parameterization where we, we, we can understand it as a, we are predicting the denoised um, data point, but with this uh, uh, weight schedules. So, actually, there are already tons of works, uh, and especially the multimedia research based on diffusion model, for example, some video research and uh, audio research. And uh, also, there's also some game methods, but uh, well, they are very, still very promising, but uh, in recent days, they are just used as a baseline for the diffusion model. So most of the generative uh, uh, model, especially on multimedia works, focus on some unimodal translation tasks, such as, for example, the video prediction, or the text-to-video generation, and text-to-audio transcription, 
and or the video to audio generation and audio to, to video generation. So basically, we have we want to from 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 place A to place B, just a one directional generation task. Uh, however, so we would like to we would like to in our project we would like to can we can we do something like a more promising like to do two pro, uh, to do two tasks in one model like the uh, video to audio generation and the audio to video generation. So I think for now only the diffusion model can handle this kind of task. So then I will explain it uh, about our methods. So currently, currently to the best of our uh, to our knowledge. This MM diffusion model is so far the only model that can handle this uh, multimodal generation scheme. Uh, however, so the purpose of the author that created this model is that just they focus more on the multimodal unconditional generation and the quality evaluation. So basically, they would like to simultaneously create the video and audio, and uh, but uh, they do not have a sufficient examination of the the conditional, the two-way conditional generation that from the audio to video and from the video to the audio. So actually, uh, we also note that the architecture, their proposed methods can be also improved from, for more efficient training and the inference. So basically, what we focus on is that there are three parts. First, we would like to improve this, uh, the data representation. For example, uh, this author focus on the using the the pure waveform of the audio as a data input, and now using the raw pixel frames from the video for the input, and then also use a very compu slightly computational expensive cross attention mechanism to bridge to bridge the audio and the video, and uh, their methods leads to some very low resolution video generation, which is uh, actually hard to be uh, to be scaled to the higher resolution ones. So first, uh, we would like to introduce some our methods, some architectural improvements regarding that uh, MM diffusion models. So basically, uh, what we use is just some to use some uh, latent to use uh, the very popular latent diffusions. Basically, uh, for the videos, we're basically using a pre-trained stable diffusion node encoder to encode the video frames to a latent space, uh, which yields a uh, um, a very low dimensional representation and a compact representation. So this, may, this means our model can be more efficient for training the inference, and then it can also yield, uh, yield higher resolution results and higher video quality. Also for, for, for audio, so we do some similar, but, uh, um, but, we, but uh, what we use is just to transform the audio signal to a male spectrogram representation instead of the waveform. So we also have a separate a pre-trained vocoder to reconstruct the audio from the from from the male spectrogram to the actual waveform audio. So uh, this male spectrogram representation is usually also very more e more efficient because and more compact than the pure waveform. So in this case, so the overall structure of our model is that it can be described like this. Basically, what we have is a a stable diffusion encoder to encode the video representation and the, as a, this is a V representation. And also a male transform the, and to transform the audio signal to a audio, audio representation, which is a male spectrogram representation. And uh, we are focused on training this joint latent diffusion model. And uh, after training, when we take the, that uh, to reverse that uh, sto stochastic differential equation, so we can generate a, a video representation in V and a v audio representation in A. Then we applied a, a stable diffusion decoder to decode the actual video frames and a, or an, another a male gain to, as a vocoder to decode the uh, male, male spectrogram information to the actual waveform. So um, and additionally, as I said, so the cross attention mechanism used in the MM diffusion paper is not very efficient. So basically, we also try to um, uh, replace this cross attention part with some more easier modeling uh, design, and uh, which is already yields very good results. Uh, what we do is very fairly simple. So for example, for here, we start with some video tensor, and this is the audio tensor. And to merge the information of the audio and the videos, we basically what we do is just just do some temporal interpolation of the video to the same temporal size of the audio, and we also do some max pooling, 
and then we concatenate this two tensor and do apply in the convolution 1D channel merge to create a merged audio tensor. And for the video tensor, we do uh, some sim something similar. We also do some temporal interpolation and uh, to inter interpolate the T2 to the same size as T1. And then we do some, uh, some spatial repeat, which means we just repeats, uh, repeat the element spatially to the same size as the video tensor and concatenate it with the video tensor and get the merged video tensor. And this, uh, this method is fairly simple and computationally efficient, but uh, we found that it's, it's already yielded sufficient and good results. So it's not very necessary to use the cross attention. So uh, aside from the architectural improvement, we also improve our training scheme for better visual audio alignment. So actually our core idea is to use a contrastive learning. So this ORD 2018 proposed a contrastive loss for representation learnings. Uh, basically, so here I try to explain it briefly. So for here, we use A and V to represent our audio and video. So this contrastive loss describe a conditional generation case. So that's uh, we want to give a video, we want to generate the audio. And uh, this A prime, capital A prime is a set of the misaligned audio given the video Vs. And FAV is some density ratio between audio and video. And this, uh, it's, this distance ratio also corresponds to the mutual information and audio and video. Intuitively, we are maximizing the mutual information for aligned video audio pair and minimizing the mutual information for misaligned video audio pairs. So follow, uh, based, on this, uh, based on this previous work, uh, the CDCD proposed a diff diffusion contrastive loss for unimodal conditional generation. Uh, what, uh, what they did is that actually this, this form is too similar. Basically what they did is that to replace this uh, uh, distance ratio with some sort of the diffusion loss functions, where this diffusion loss is basically a conditional variant of the, of the, uh, of the, optimi of the loss function that we use to optimize the score functions uh, with a Gaussian prior. Uh, here we only consider the Gaussian case uh, of the diffusion model, but the, this ori uh, but the original author, well, the author of the CDCD, CD consider a discrete diffusion model. But I think the core idea is the same. It's just uh, different kinds of representations. So in our case, uh, because we are creating a multi a multimodal diffusion models, uh, so we try to extend this multimodal contrastive loss to the a uh, unimodal contrastive law to the multimodal one. What we do is that uh, to to apply not only you, using the misaligned audio audio data, but also we create some misaligned video data. Uh, in this case, our loss function is no longer no longer a conditional diffusion model, but a jo modeling a joint distribution between the A and V. So, but uh, for the for the loss function, we are mean we are not only minimize, uh, minimize the score loss for the, for the audio input, but also minimize the score loss for the video input. So however, so uh, as, we, as we can see in the, the original also use some, use the sum here, which means uh, they need to iterate uh, lots of the, uh, um, uh, lots of the contrastive samples for the misaligned video, uh, audio and a misaligned video. However, so it uh, can be very expensive because they, this, will, um, this will lead to a very huge batch size. So basically during our training steps, we basically select some random contrastive samples at each gradient descent steps. To create contrastive samples, uh, what we do is uh, also just, it's, it's uh, maybe just a form of the data augmentations. Uh, what we do is that uh, we randomly shift the video or audio temporarily, uh, which means uh, which makes a two, which makes a pair video audio pair and unaligned. And uh, also we also randomly segment the video and audios and swap some segment be, um, between different pairs so that we can also create contrast loss. The most naively we can you just swap the whole video or the video to create a contrastive to create the contrastive samples. So based on the information above, uh, we can we will rebuild our model. Then we, how can we do to do to to do the conditional generation? So our method is also 
it's also existing in previous works, like in this VDM. So what they do is doing some a classifier um, guidance method to guide to guide the conditional uh, to guide the model the generation path of the of that reverse stochastic process, and uh, and this guidance is uh, is evoked by this uh, uh, replacement and the gradient. Uh, he, uh, to explain this, uh, this is our this uh, this is how it performs during the uh, generation process. Basically, we have our trend model theta, and we are given the, some noisy noisy audio sample at at uh, at the denoising step t plus one. We replace the vi video input from some from the diffusion process, uh, which denotes as a uh, v hat t plus one. And we take this one step, and then we can get the next next step output at the at the AT and VT. However, this uh, uh, this AT is not is not not going to the right direc direction to the in the that's a reverse stochastic process. So we need to correct uh, this uh, uh, audio uh, noisy audio with uh, this gradient term, where basically we are minimizing. Uh, where here we calculate the reconstruction error. Of uh, reconstruction error of the uh, video and the time step t, and calculate its gradient respect to at, and uh, then we can correct this at with this gradient term. And we also have a, a weight schedule for this gradient uh, uh, named as lambda t. So, if there's any question regarding the method, uh, yeah, one question for the. Uh the, the, um, the contrastive loss, the adversarial examples, uh, you've only you've only shifted on in video relatively, right? I, I know you had the you had the switching of segments, but I'm wondering if maybe uh, time stretch could also have worked for to so mm. actually create a misalignment between the beat. Yeah, that's. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, well, we never yeah, think about it. <laughs> 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 That's a delay. <laughs> yeah, it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> so I wonder if, like, I'm thinking of, of one of your examples has the dance videos, right? And I'm wondering if uh, shifting the audio relative to dancing, it's still in, like, it could still potentially be perceived as being in sync when the beat patterns. Yeah, so that's a that's a problem that we. <laughs> Right. Later, right. right. Whereas if you if you uh, and also you might if you shift too much, you might actually end up on the beat again. So yes, yes, that's enough. Uh, whereas with uh, time stretch or contraction, you could you could basically ensure that it's out of sync, regardless of how you shift it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's dive into our uh, experiment regarding our model. So basically, we evaluate uh, we evaluate our model on three data sets. Uh, the first is the AIST++, which is actually a uh, which is actually a dancing data set with a dancer and accompanying the music, and uh, also an epic kitchen data set. So this this data set basically contains a person first person camera view of human actions inside the kitchen. Like the cooking or making, preparing other foods or some stuff, and finally we show some qualitative samples for the landscape dataset, which basically this is consi uh, consists of some more static videos of the natural natural landscapes. So we conduct multiple evaluation for our model. So first we have some objective evaluation. So for the ev objective evaluation, we use some. If we, we use the FVD score to evaluate the uh, perceptual quality for the audio to video generation, and we only perform it on this dancing data set. For the FAD, uh, we we also evaluate the perceptual quality for the audio per, from the uh, in the V2A tra uh, v, v, V2A transcription, and we evaluate it on the dancing data set and the kitchen data set. We also do some bit tracking, uh, bit tracking for the for the music alignment in the, you know, for the dancing data set. Uh, more importantly, we also do some uh, subjective, uh, subjective evaluation and uh, for both the audio to video and video to audio uh, evaluation uh, from, from the quality perspective and also from the alignment perspective. 
And finally, we will show some qualitative examples regarding our model from, from all three data sets. So let's start with some um, video evaluation. Actually, so here we, we simply report the FVD score between our, uh, so our test samples, uh, between the ground truth test sample and our, our, our conditional generated video samples. Actually, we can find that uh, our, uh, our model trend with a contrast field loss with, uh, with uh, phi E minus phi yields the best result. And uh, actually, the also this uh, with, even without contrast fields, actually the model also performs um, uh, performs pretty well. And we evaluated uh, the model on different settings. For example, we use uh, select the first 18 frames or first uh, 36 frames, and this is a resolution. The reason why we choose uh, 64 is that because this uh, multi MM diffusion baseline only can only handle 64 times 64 resolution data. So we, so we, we down, down, downscale our generation result to match the same resolution. Uh, but uh, as you can see, our model can usually maintain more consistency, a better consistency uh, when we apply different, uh, different lengths of the video generations. For example, here, uh, but, the, the, but, but the multimodal diffusion, which is uh, MIM diffusion, uh, the model seems to fail on maintaining a high FAD score when, um, when, the, when, the, when the generated sequence is getting longer. Uh, uh, we also know that uh, our model is trained on uh, 18 frames, and then this uh, multimodal diffu MM diffusion is trained on this uh, 16 frames sequences. Also, uh, based, uh, for this uh, for the video quality evaluation, we do a very, uh, do a um, subjective evaluation to us, and we ask people about the, to rating the video quality and the temporal consistency of the generated audio, uh, generated videos. Uh, basically, as as you can see, our our model because our model can handle higher resolutions, it's uh, it's a uh, it's very. It's not a surprise that our model can get a, 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 high, a higher uh, video quality than the MM diffusion baselines, but it seems that our model is well. The contrast loss cannot improve the uh, perceptual quality of the video uh, of, of the of the video is, and the, the both models have the have the similar similar uh, perceptual rating on this. And also about the generated audio and uh, generated video, we also ask the user to rating to rate the alignment of the generated video to the to the given audios. Uh, compared to baselines, uh, both our model with or without contrast loss can do better than the baseline. Uh, however, it's uh, it's again because it's hard to discriminate whether our contrastive loss works here because. Um, because uh, they have a similar similar score between each other, um, but the only good thing is our with the contrast model, our model seems to have slightly um, lower variance on the scoring. Uh, oh, and another thing I want to mention about is that because um, because the vi audio to video generation is not very well, I think the generated quality is not is. is not good enough, so that's it may create some artifacts that the, the dancer may, may have the third arm or third leg. So this may also influence the influence the people's evaluation. Uh, then we dive into the audio evaluations. So we first, as a, uh, similar to the similar similar to the video evaluation, we just evaluate the perceptual quality of the audio. Uh, what we do is to calculate the free audio distance, which is the FAD score, for uh, between between the gen conditionally generated audio and the ground truth audios. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, it seems that uh, uh, while our model can can perform better than the baselines, it seems that our contrast contrast loss still not um, contribute uh, make great contribute great contributions here. So all the models have a very similar. Uh, FAD score, uh, score as you can see here. So uh, this number shows uh, the 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 weight we applied to the contrastive loss. So the zero means uh, without contrastive loss. So here we show two FAD scores. The one is for the one is with a box plot. The box plot is corresponds to 
uh, Hennis and uh, Azilia's previous work about, uh, they, they, they find that the, you, they, they calculate the per sample F FAD score can better reflect the audio quality. So we can generate a box plot. And uh, also we also attach the, the, the distribution wise FAD score, which we calculate the distribution between the generated audio Especially the FAT score between the distribution of the generated audio and the ground truth audio, but they still show that the difference is not much with or without contrastive loss. I think uh, things uh, things is similar uh, for uh, for kitchen data set. Um, the case is that uh, while it's, but it seems that with uh, without without contrastive loss, it seems to have a. A lower contrast velocity seems to have a better result than air contrast velocity. Uh, we assume that this may cause by the contrast velocity still, uh, still regular, slightly regularize the gen generated quali generation qualities. Uh, for the temporal correlations, uh, we're also doing uh, doing the to to track the beats of the generated dancing and uh, dancing audios, and uh, we. We cho cho choose two different thresholds for the beat uh, for the uh, beat hit rate. For example, the uh, zero point one second means uh, we accept uh, we ac only accept uh, the the corresponding beat within one, zero point one seconds. This one is a more uh, is a more uh, lower a uh, higher tolerance for for that uh, hit rate. Uh, you can see see that well while our model seems to slightly performs better. Here's with us uh, with a stronger contrastive loss, but well, I think, um, but that's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's not a very a, a strong result regarding to no contrastive loss. But uh, but so it's obvious that our model can still be, performs better than the MM diffusion baselines. Okay, here comes to the most important subjective evaluation. So, because uh, here we are using the liberals as a bit tracker to track the to to track the tempo tempo um, the tempo beats of the music, but I think that's uh, we well, there's some tons of hyperparameters we can find, and it's uh, not very accurate. So, so we think still this in this case the subjective evaluation is also plays an uh, important role here. So the left side shows some shows our. Uh, some temporal uh, temporal alignment of the audio regarding to the um, video in dancing data set. Uh, from here, what what we can observe that from the acoustic, from both the acoustic and the musical perspective. Uh, oh, here these two metrics are not about alignment, just about the still still the subjective quality of the audios. What we can find here is that uh, the baselines have a huge variance on, on people's for people's evaluation, um, but our proposed model, while it's, uh, it's it can be it looks as a slightly better than than, than the baseline, but it's of course has a lower uh, lo lower it's a lower variance, and it's also worth noting that even with a ground truth, the people cannot given the given the very high rating on the. Um, uh, on the on the alignment, but uh, now there, uh, we go to the temporal correlation, which is alignment of the video and of audios. We can find that the baseline is a it's a it's a way behind than our model, but our still our our model with and without contrast flaws still perform have a similar performance, and uh, but again the ground truth still have a very high variance on this uh, on this. Uh, Audio uh, dancing audio test. So this this may indicates actually it's still a uh, very challenging, even for people to identify whether the audio or video have a good alignment for that uh, for that uh, music and the dancing stuff. However, uh, the most interesting part is our kitchen test sets. So here we are te we are testing our. Uh, contrast. We, we don't have the baseline model here, but we compare our model with our model with contrastive loss. Uh, what I can, what we can observe is the the acoustic quality of our model uh, of the two two model have a very similar performance, 
But the, both the semantic alignment and the temporal alignment is, it has, a, has a huge gap between each other. For, for, for this one, for the semantic alignment, because here you can see it has a, high, it has, it has a higher rate than model without contrastive loss. Now for the temporal alignment, it's also a huge gap between the contrastive loss and non-contrastive loss. So because this kitchen data set consists of some just just very have some strong audio visual correlation events like the, you cook something you have some hand movement or you have some your your spoon or other stuff and you are cutting something so there are very strong video and uh, and the audio correlation so so we think the, so our contrastive loss seems to perform pretty well in this case. So, are there any question regarding so far? How many judges you have here? How, how many users? Gigas judges. Uh, I think it's like eleven or twelve. Yeah, eleven or twelve. It's like eleven. You just got two more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. With respect to these uh, ratings, um, so with uh, particular participants may have uh, particular biases towards one uh, space or another. If you were to standardize these ratings, for example, by applying a z-score, I wonder what the uh, what if any differences there might be. So essentially, each person is normalized within their own ratings. Uh, that's cool. um, yes. We, we, unfortunately, we didn't do that, but I think that's a, that's a good suggestion for our next step. Yeah. So finally, uh, I'm going to show some qualitative samples and uh, to show to have a to show how our model works here. So for example, this one is our model generated the audio with a dancing, audio, uh, dancing video with a contrastive loss. Sorry? Oh, okay, let's give the ground truth first. Do I need to play again? There's some, some audio missing at the, I think it's a, because it's a speaker's problem. <laughs> but I think it can still reflect something. And this is our contrastive loss one. And this is a result without contrastive loss. Well, it's uh, I have, <laughs> it's uh, slightly hard, right? So to distinguish which one is a better alignment. But from my own perspective, I think that uh, here our contrastive loss will somewhat works better than the non contrastive one because it seems that the, the dancer is a, his 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 feet is matching <laughs> the beat some somewhere. So you are okay. <laughs> Uh, then we show some example with uh, some generated audios with the uh, same dancing and the same hand movement in the kitchen. The ground truth, and then we will generate the audio. And this is a uh, no contrast loss generated audio. Well, hard, right? <laughs> yes. So that can, actually this can can sort of explain uh, why our in our subjective evaluation that uh, this uh, alignment is actually not make, make much difference between the 
model with and without contrast those. But I think this kitchen one is uh, more obvious. It's like the steering the soup and this our contrastive one. And no contrastive one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, yes, I think so for our model, maybe it works better on so this uh, more more higher correlation with a uh, visual audio correlation. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, here. So also I, we do some qualitative examples on this on the Latin scale data set. We didn't do very, we didn't do evalu uh, some any evaluation on it. We just show some examples because this data set is a very just some some static landscape. Uh, really. So did you do audio? No, that's a unconditional generation. Okay. So basically, we generate both audio and video from the noise at the same time. So here, so both are sample, are sample audio. For example, this is uh, some ocean stuff. Yes, yeah, so the reason why it's too short is that I find that uh, this, uh, this the model trend on this uh, data set cannot work, doesn't, doesn't quite work so when, when, when I try different, <laughs> different number of frames. So yes, here I just show the, six, uh, the just 18 frames. So what we use is a, uh, 10 frame per second. So that's uh, just 1.8 second. <laughs> it's another one. But it's supposed to be some sound at the beginning, but it seems. <laughs> Make it a given one. Play it in infinite loop. Yeah, can I do this? Not yet. <laughs> and this is um, some forest, a creek, or some sort of thing. Well, but you, as you can see here, actually this uh, this data set is actually not good at to to do this kind of the the correlation evaluation sort of thing because the background noise is more like some some white noise sort of things, right? So okay, so then comes to the conclusion. So in this project, uh, we first present a hand the multimodal. Uh, diffusion model capable of generating high quality video and audio and uh, both conditionally and uh, unconditionally. And then additionally, we introduce a uh, contrast loss to enhance the uh, temporal and semantic alignment for video to audio and audio to video generation task. So although our experimental results indicate that the uh, contrast loss does not significantly improve the alignment for the uh, dancing data set, but uh, it does show some competitive competitive performance on the kitchen data set, which should get a more robust visual and audio uh, correspondence. So I think, yeah, that's all about our research. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
using the pure waveform of, of the audio, which means that there's a very long sequences and it makes the uh, inference very slow. So what we do is uh, to use a male spectrogram to sort of uh, compress the representation and, uh, and then it's another method to make our model training faster and uh, the male to waveform converter does it have the limitation of 16 kilohertz or it can go, or it can go higher? I think it can go higher. Yeah, like for both, like both, like for, for the images we used the uh, uh, encoder and decoder from stable diffusion and that uh, can handle also any resolution and you can also train the, the male gun vocoder on any audio resolution that you like. So that's kind of flexible to decouple the, the resolutions from the the diffusion model. So technically what prevents you from higher quality audio and video is just computational and resources limitation? I, I think for audio, I think so the, the limitation is not... Is not there. Is actually not there. So, so actually, directly with this model without retraining, we could generate 48 kilohertz audio. We just essentially can swap out the vocoder. I'm not sure if this works for the video, Encoding might have to retrain the whole uh, thing, right? Because I don't I know if the representation this. will be identical. That the is video I think you. will. Yes, theoretically it should be, but in practice, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, with respect to temporal alignment, uh, it sounded like the, the kitchen data set was a lot more, a lot easier to judge temporally than the dance data set. Do you think that uh, if you were to continue this, you would continue asking the temporal alignment for dance, or do you think it's maybe just a different category that maybe, uh, you know? It's, uh, yeah, it's actually from the content creation perspective, so maybe some, if we can do do well in dance, and that's that'd be that be would great, right? But as we show that, well, the model can only works well on this uh, on data set with a high correlation between the visual and the audio aspects. So <coughs> it's hard to answer, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, yes. From if we want to have good results, I think we are continue working on this. Uh, Kitchen like some, <laughs> but uh, if we from make them more fancier or want to some to attract in people, so I think the dancing will be to uh, to work on that. That so would be great. But uh, do you have any suggestion about? I, I, I just think uh, so. You know, have, looking at many of these examples, uh, I had to listen like very hard yeah. if I wanted to make that sort of you know crisp uh, temporal alignment. A lot of, uh, you know, dance is usually very free and people don't necessarily even hit the beat. Uh, they may be feeling the beat, but, um, so I, I was thinking maybe, you know, that, that may not be a, a I, I'm not sure if, te if temporal alignment is the right metric, maybe tempo instead or something like that. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think temporal alignment is just more difficult with dance. Yes. Yes, that's a, that, that, that's indeed a, a problem here. Maybe you are correct. That's so maybe it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely hard to, mm -hmm. not easy to evaluate, like even for um, musically trained people, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so right. There, there might be uh, better ways mm -hmm. to, to better metrics. It's, yep. it's true. And so um, maybe as a follow up to that, like um, I, I guess the. One, one central component here is the contrastive loss, right? Yeah. And uh, it, so one, one way to go could be to ask different questions from the subjects, but the other way might be to think about um, uh, other ways to uh, maximize the contrastive loss or, or create, create counter examples that really um, should produce a high contrastive loss. And so for example, with, with the dance set, um, uh, you could think about using ground truth samples and then augmenting the audio in different ways or vice versa, use ground truth audio to augment the video in different ways and see 
which ones produce the biggest disagreement for human mm -hmm. observers. So use the human as kind of a contrastive loss metric and then derive from that how you should, because uh, yeah, to the point like with dancing, you can probably shift the beat like plus minus 10% and it still looks like it's on, it's in sync because the, the dancer just might have different ways of following the beat, right? They might be a little early or a little, a little late, but a human might be able to tell these look the same to me or this one is completely off. And same with the other methods you had, like swapping segments around, both for, for dancing and kitchen. Because um, it, it feels like the, if, 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 the, if that loss is a central component of your method and uh, you, Rather than having to guess what what good contrastive examples might be, uh, it might be it might be good to explore that a little more. Like, uh, yes, I agree, but that's a uh, tons of extra work, right? Yeah, 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 <laughs> because instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't have to do this by tomorrow. End of the day. Okay. More questions? No one from your remote? Okay. Seven other questions. Okay, then let's uh, thank the speaker again.